Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa and welcome to Threshold of Hope. It's our program where we bring you the opportunity to be able to understand and study the writings of the church. And we are now in a document known as, in its Latin title, Fides et Ratio. Now, you can order that from the Pauline sisters in a printed form and um, uh, go on their website. Uh, and Or you can also get this if you go to uh, our own EWTN website, EWTN.com. If you click where it says the Faith tab, you'll see the libraries. And in the document library, you can write, type in Fides et Ratio, R-A-T-I-O, in uh, you, you can download that document into your computer for free. If you want to print it out, you have to pay for your own printing. But you can read along with us uh, from your computer or print it out. You're more than welcome. And also while you're at EWTN.com, you may want to uh, take a look at previous programs uh, to see you know, where, where we're going and some of the developments it's all documented or available there, archived, as they call it there. Now, last week, we began with paragraph five. And we only got parts one and two of paragraph five started. And one of the points that the Pope was making is that a lot of modern philosophy focuses on human beings, and especially since the 1600s, philosophers have been focusing on how do I know that I know something. Remember, um, you probably have heard, even in high school, um, the famous saying of René Descartes, uh, I know because I am, all right? And so, so that this, um, you know, that because he knows that he exists, that's how he knows that he knows. Um, uh, so uh, I, I know therefore I am, that it's because he knows that he is. And, you know, that set, that, that, that kind of philosophy from Descartes, set the stage for the questions over the next 300 years, people kept thinking about that, how do we know anything? And when you study philosophy, you see that philosophers have all kinds of approaches to how do I know that I know anything? So that you go to a, a radical philosopher like David Hume. David Hume was a Scotsman living in the late 1700s. And he denied that there's any such thing as logical consequences. And I mentioned last week how he used the example himself. When you're playing billiards, you take a cue stick, you hit the cue ball, and it hits another ball that hits another one, right? And you use geometry to have that happen the way you want. So you went get points and win the game. But he said, just because I hit the cue ball with the cue stick this time cannot be proof that it will work every time. Now, I don't know how often he played billiards. And I certainly have suspicions as to how good he might have been. Because people who play billiards or pool depend on knowing the right angle and the right amount of pressure in using a cue stick to hit the cue ball, to hit the ball they want to go. Right? I mean, they. 
for they assume that it's always going to work correctly, especially if they develop that skill. That is their assumption. David Hume said, you can't prove it. So this causes radical skepticism. He says, you, you, if you do it a million times, maybe there'll be a million and one times where it doesn't work. And he doesn't want to blame himself for being bad at billiards. He's saying that it's not always logical, or you can't, it's better yet, you cannot prove that it is logical, that it will always hit. And so that's, again, that's the beginning of radical skepticism. And if you think David Hume was skeptical, you should try, and I do mean try, to read a philosopher named Derrida. Uh, Derrida, I don't know if he's still alive. Um, he was alive in the early 90s and lectured, came and gave guest lectures at the university where I was. And he taught postmodernist philosophy. And the postmodernists say, all knowledge, all uses of words are arbitrary. So whatever meaning I give a word is the meaning it has for me. And you can give it another meaning, and then that's the meaning it has for you. And it can be the same word, and you have your meaning, I have my meaning, and it doesn't matter if we agree. I say that's true. It doesn't matter if we agree. So long as I don't bother to have a conversation with Professor Derrida. But if we want to have a conversation and talk, then it matters that we understand the same words to mean the same things. Now, of course, sometimes, and this is always true in all languages, words can have different nuances. That's true. And one of the skills you want to train people to do is learn those nuances of language. Learn how to speak a language with more refinement, more precision, more accuracy, more beauty. But someone like Derrida would say, there's no such thing as beauty that everybody can agree on. And after some visits I've made to certain modern galleries of art, I would agree that what some people call beautiful in those museums is not what I would call beautiful. I feel a lot more at home with the beauty in the ancient Greek section, in the medieval section, and in the Renaissance section, then I say, ah, now that is beauty that elevates my spirit. While I cannot wait to get out of some of the modern artists, I mean, I've tried, I tried. But, you know, they say, well, that's just your criteria of beauty. And I have my, and this is beautiful to me, this is my criteria of beauty. Now, the reason I'm going into all this is that we're beginning in sec paragraph 5.3 today. And the Pope says, and, and I'm just giving some examples with David Hume and Professor Derrida, but there are others too in post-modernist uh, thought. And in uh, what they, as a matter of fact, Professor Derrida is more specifically called deconstructionalist. 
very, very popular in many English departments. I, I, again, it was popular. Um, I don't know if it's still popular, but the idea that you deconstruct the language. I simply prefer the word I learned long before Professor Derrida, which would be to destroy the language and its qualities. That's what I fear many of them are doing. They'll disagree with me, I know. And they are writing their own dissertations. They are getting their own professorships. So they'll look on me as being a fool, I have no doubt. But by everything that you know, I ever learned, uh, I would say they're destroying the language. And I don't find their poetry or their art to be beautiful. Call me old fashioned, but give me Shakespeare. And that's why, because of the rise of these different philosophies, these plus others, the Pope says, this whole, the last 300 years of philosophy, where philosophers are so focused on what our own experience of knowing something is. What do I know? How do I know I know anything? How do I know myself? That focus on the human being has given rise to different forms of agnosticism. That's why I mentioned Hume. Hume says, I don't know if you can prove that there's a logic. In fact, he said, you cannot prove that logic is logical. So he's agnostic, not just about God's existence. He's agnostic about the existence of logic. Now that's pretty basic. But there are a lot of people in the culture who are agnostic about whether logic is logical. Now, in general, most modern people do like science and engineering and technology because we can use it. Even if it is based on logic. I mean, you know, if you, do you ever hang around an engineering school? This is not a group that is touchy-feely and talking about their emotions all day. And they want to make sure all the electric lines go together and that the engineering principles work and that the building doesn't collapse. They don't care how pretty the architect's drawing might be. Will it stand up is what an engineer wants to know. And then we'll make it look good. But um, so it's very logical to use engineering science, technology, and we like that. But, and this is going to be one of the issues all of us have to deal with, a lot of people don't want to apply logic to the way they think about what is right and wrong. They don't want to think through moral questions. They don't want to think through the existence of God. Like the agnostic I one time met, um, I, I was on a treadmill or something at, at a gymnasium, and you know, he said, oh yeah, I went to Sunday school, but when I was 11, my parents gave me the option, I decided, I said, oh, I'm an agnostic, I won't go. I said, well, how old are you now? He said, 58. Do you know yet? He said, no. I said, that's intellectual laziness. You're indolent. By now, you've had 46 years to think about whether to get over your ignorance. Hopefully, you've done better than that on learning how to use the phone. You know, you should get, okay, by the way, uh, I just like to point out to people, agnostic is from a Greek root. Gnosis is the Greek word for knowledge. 
Agnosis means not knowledge. Agnosticos means not knowing. And so when you use the word agnostic, it sounds a little more sophisticated. But that's only because you're using the Greek word. If you use the Latin root, then you would end up with just admitting you're ignorant. And if you use the Anglo-Saxon root, because our language is an Anglo-Saxon language, a German language, then you would just use the word dumb. <laughs> That's not quite as fancy as agnostic, though. So, we have, uh, the Pope is saying that philosophy has lost its way. You know, there, you have people who are bragging that they're agnostic, that is to say, ignorant. That is to say, dumb, just depending on which word you'd like to use from which root. And you have what he calls the shifting sands of widespread skepticism. So a lot of people in our culture today don't want to figure out whether God exists, the purpose of their own lives, the purpose of other people? Are other people there just for my pleasure? For my financial improvement? Are they there for me to use or do they have inherent value? If you stay an agnostic, you won't answer that. And the skepticism is a problem. And so, what we see is the rise to prominence of various doctrines of philosophy that tend to devalue the truths that you deem certain. For instance, we talked a couple weeks ago how the doctrine of non-contradiction, the doctrine of non-contradiction says something cannot be what it is and at the same moment, not be what it is. You can't contradict yourself. You can, so I can't say, this is a book. This is not a book. Make up your mind. Now, in my understanding of the deconstructionists, like Derrida, is that you could say that. See, almost everybody in the world, except overly educated people think that you cannot hold self-contradictory ideas at the same time. And so this is something that uh, you normally judge that to be a certain doctrine. For sure you know this, but they say, ah, it's not so certain. Not to them. Everything is up for grabs. And um, while there are a legitimate plurality of positions, there are different ways to approach various issues. That's for sure. And the Pope and the Church have always guaranteed that. You can approach it from different angles and different ideas so that, um, you know, the way your doctor knows you and the way your spouse knows you, still mean it's you. One is, doing, is knowing you through an x-ray machine, and the other one doesn't care about the x-ray machine unless the doctor finds something. Thus, your spouse knows you in the way you act and speak. Now, both, they don't contradict each other. It's two different approaches to knowing you. And generally, you want both. I want my doctor to take an x-ray when it's necessary to find out what's going on inside of me. But I want my friends to know me from the inside in a different way. In terms of what I think and what, what I choose to do. So this is a very important thing, to have legitimate plurality. But now it's gone overboard. It's what he calls undifferentiated pluralism. You just 
Think whatever you want. And you come to that point of relativism where it says, well, look, I've got my idea, you've got your idea, and we have no basis upon which to discuss it. We have no basis that we share because we assume that all positions are equally valid. But if that's true, then none of them are valid. So that's one of the problems. And this is what he calls one of the most widespread symptoms of a lack of confidence in truth. As a matter of fact, I would say that the patron I don't want to call patron saint, but the patron of modern philosophy is Pontius Pilate, who when Jesus said that he came to witness to the truth, Pilate said, ah, what is truth? That would be the attitude of the majority of people in the world uh, uh, today. Even certain ideas about life that come from the of the Eastern world, from the Orient, from East Asia, betray this lack of confidence. Because even some of the Oriental uh, I, uh, philosophies deny truth, its exclusive character. And some of them say they reveal truth in all these different doctrines, even if they contradict each other. So Christ, some people who take an Oriental view, and a lot of New Agers did this, well, you know, you can have 30 million gods, as some Hindus believe, or you can believe in Brahma only, or you can believe in the Christian God, and it's all, it's all the same. And unfortunately, I've certainly even heard various Christians and even some Catholics say, well, you know, Hinduism is just one way to God, Buddhism is just another way, Islam another way, Christianity is just another way, even though they contradict each other. The Quran contradicts the gospel. Did Jesus die on the cross or didn't he? Quran says no. Gospels say yes. No, they, they can't both be true. That's where the principle of non-contradiction comes in. And this is true for these other religions as well. On this understanding, everything gets reduced to your own opinion. You have your opinion, I have mine. And we just state that we have opinions, but we don't have a way to discuss those opinions. And then it becomes chaos. And I, as I've said many times, uh, the Pope mentions that there's a sense of being adrift. That uh, on one hand, philosophical thinking has succeeded in coming closer to the reality of human life as forms of expression. But as it pursues various issues, for instance, what is existential uh, or language. You know, some philosophies say all you can do is understand what the structure of a language is. It's a linguistic approach, and there are a variety of others like that. Uh, or you take an existential approach, and it's just how I experience existence as it is, and so on. All of these ignore the radical question about the truth of personal existence. You say, okay, you exist, but within existence is the truth. And somebody like Jean-Paul Sartre, a French philosopher, he fought in the underground during the war and after the war, uh, you know, did, was very extremely influential in European philosophy. And he said, there's no meaning in life at all. All I can do is experience myself as having the freedom to choose whatever I want to choose. And that's the only thing he had. All I can do is just make a choice. And that for him, courage was just living 
in a meaningless world trying to make a decision. Well, you know what the reality was for him? He had to fight against committing suicide his whole adult life because he had no meaning. And it's, it's not my later psychoanalysis of him. He admits his struggle against suicide because human beings, as we Christians would point out, are meant to have meaning. When he said, there is no meaning and you can't know it. When he just bravely said that, he ran from one illicit affair after another. He shacked up with his girlfriend, but cheated on her for decades and constantly struggled to commit suicide until the end of his life. When finally, he went to confession, came back to the sacraments, married his girlfriend, and died a Catholic. Then he could find some peace. But this is what he had to struggle with. So we have to struggle with the radical questions of, of the truth of personal existence, the truth of being, what does it mean to say that you exist, that you are, and the truth about God. And that, that's why we see among a lot of the people of our own time attitudes of widespread distrust of the human being's great capacity for knowledge. You know, just look at the way a lot of the comedies on TV, they give you a little window into that absence of knowledge, absence of meaning, and how they run from one episode after another of experiences of self-centeredness. That's the basis of contemporary humor. One experience after another of self-centered life. It's all about me. And a lot of modern people have a false modesty. What they'll say is that they have provisional truth, they have partial truth, they know a little something, and they say, that's all I can ever know, so I don't ask the radical questions. I don't ask the basic questions about the meaning of life, what is right and wrong, what is true, what is false. I'm not going to ask that. I'll just deal with who's winning on American Idol. That they know. They don't know who the vice president of the United States is, but they know who's winning on American Idol. I'm in the other category. I know the vice president's name. I have no idea who's in American Idol. But this is what happens. You opt for fundamentally superficial stuff because you don't know what life is about, its meaning, its ultimate foundations, the personal, social existence, the existence of God. In short, the hope that philosophy might be able to provide definitive answers to these questions has dwindled in modern life. People don't think that. And I guarantee you, again, I'm going to say this many times because we're seeing it lived out. When people do not have a basis for discussing the meaning of life and truth, they don't have a basis in logic and thought and in history and things like that, when they don't know any of that stuff, then all that they can do is in place of seeking what is true, they seek might. Because in a relativistic culture, might makes right. If I win the votes, then whatever I want happens. Not because it's true, but because I get the votes, or I get the guns, or I get the power. And once I have the power, I can make you do what I want. 
and or if I can shout you down instead of listening to your arguments. I don't care about your arguments. I want what I want. Pay attention to that in the questions on abortion, marriage, and other issues. And they're doing it on those issues now. I guarantee you that will also happen on many other issues about your own life. Especially as we come to crises, as funds are disappearing because of overborrowing and all that. The questions about what we do with you now that you're a little old, a little sick, a little inconvenient, or you disagree with me. Those questions will be decided not on the basis of what is right and true, but on who has the power. So this is where, that's why these things are so important. They're not just philosophical theory, they come to play in everyday politics. They already are, and they cont will continue to do so. Well, we're going to take a break and come back and get some questions and comments, so please stay with us. <laughs> Thank you very much and welcome back. I have a nice group of folks from a wide variety of parts of the United States and we'd love to have you come and join us as well. If you can, please contact our pilgrimage department. You can reach them at 205-271-2966. So 205-271-2966. Or you can also go to our website, ewtn.com, and uh, they, what they can do is let you know the schedule for the masses, the live programs, or you can be in the audience. Also, uh, they'll let you know about directions to Hansville and what's going on to pray with the sisters. And the... Um, places you can stay. And I, again, I hope a lot of you folks, uh, especially the ones who've come from up north, a lady from Duluth, that's far away, and got to try a little bit of our Alabama uh, barbecue. Uh, go over to a uh, barbecue place over here called Golden Rule, religiously themed. <laughs> Hamburger heaven, religiously themed. And, of course, you've got the Arndale Cafe where you can get the fried green tomatoes. That's the movie, Fried Green Tomatoes, was uh, the book was written over here, and it's about that restaurant. So come and get the home of those places, too. So come on and enjoy Birmingham and be part of our audience as well. All right, let's start off with a question from our studio audience. Start with you, ma'am. Where are you from? Signal Mountain, Tennessee, Alexian it, Village. I uh, know the place well. Matter of fact, I did a debate in Chattanooga some years ago, and a number of people from uh, Alexian Village came down there to uh, cheer me on. So what is uh, your question? In speaking of the philosophy of Derrida, mm -hmm. we also come down to our terminology today and we are encouraged to be politically correct. Yes. Would you be kind enough to give us some inclination about how that would fit in with sure. John Paul's Fides Ratio and our sure. philosophy? You know, there are initially certain elements of what is politically correct that is meant to speak respectfully, and that's very positive. 
So in no way should anybody go against what's politically correct in regard to using, you know, insulting names for people of various racial groups, ethnic groups, and religious groups. We show respect. And my mother didn't need a politically correct handbook to help her get us to do that. She had the back of her hand. <laughs> and I, I, I learned, so, you know, that, uh, I, matter of fact, I remember once my brother said an obnoxious word about uh, African Americans when he was about three years old. And there wasn't any time gap between him saying that and getting a crack across the mouth and me thinking, another one, don't say that word either, you know? <laughs> <It> just, <laughs> so, but we, we were taught not to use terms that would be uh, negative toward other groups. And um, uh, so that, that, that's part of politically correct, is very good. However, there is also a very important part of what is politically correct that I think is pro highly problematic. For instance, you'll see a lot of uh, the, the, the debate about abortion is not between pro-abortion and anti-abortion people. That would be the logical way to explain it. But the pro-abortion people said, never use the phrase pro-abortion. Use pro-choice. So that that, and if in a debate you call them pro-abortion, which is what they are, then they say, I am not pro-abortion. I want abortion to be very rare. I'm pro-choice. And for us to be pro-life, you know, is considered the, the other side of this, uh, instead of anti-abortion. So, and, and it's not only there, but it's in a lot of politically correct. That's just one example. But a lot of times what is called politically correct is a way to guide political conversation in such a way to make one side more acceptable than its position really is. And it becomes what we would have called back in 1935 Germany or 1920 Soviet Union propaganda. And we just have come up with, see now, even the word propaganda has a negative term to it. So the politically correct word for propaganda is to be politically correct. <laughs> right, you know, that's, that's often the way it goes. And one of the issues is that we have to pay close attention to how we frame discussions so that the issue is addressed and not danced around. You deal with the issue at stake and not avoid what is really there, okay? So that's, that would be the way I would want to deal with that. All right, now let's take a look at an email. We have one, he says, Father Packle, can you use passages in scripture to help with personal problems by praying to the Holy Spirit to direct you to a passage to give an answer to your situation. Now this may take it out of context, but direct you in your problem or situation. This is from Bob. Um, I've come across that a number of times where people say, Lord, I need help. I just am confused. So send your Holy Spirit and then I'll open up the Bible where it hits and then I read, Haman saw Mordecai. Well, that doesn't help. You know, it's what some people used to call Bible roulette. 
And I, I think you have to be very cautious about that because it begins to use the Bible or can, you know, I, again, it doesn't start off being intended this way, but it becomes possible to try and use the Bible the way people who are superstitious would use a tarot card. <laughs> and whatever tarot card you get, you find out, oh, that's the answer. So long as the person with you reads it correctly. And we don't want to use the Bible in some superstitious way that gets you to think, oh, I just open it up and I'll trust. Uh, I, I remember uh, back in the 70s, uh, a guy that was in a prayer group I was in had done that. He just opened up the Bible and he kept coming across the, a list of names in a genealogy. At which point he realized, since it wasn't his genealogy, he wasn't Jewish. So they weren't his family. He said, this is not a good way to go about it. What you're trying to do is get God's help to listen through a problem that you've got. No doubt. And that's good. And scripture is there to help you. But it's not going to be through Bible roulette. Now it may happen now and again somebody does that, but it's very rare. And to try to make that happen and make it happen often is going to get you into trouble. Of course, everybody knows the phrase. Even the devil can quote scripture, right? Where do we know that from? The Bible. Because when Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness, he quoted the Bible, quote, quoted the Psalms to tell Jesus to jump off the temple. So you don't know if what you're getting is of the Lord or of the bad spirit. And you need to take time to listen to God. Now, that's not efficient and it's not real quick. But the issue is not just getting the right answer, as if you could put a penny in one of those old time machines, get your weight and read your fortune. That used to be a penny, um, but the penny used to be something. But uh, you know, it's not like that. We are in an interpersonal relationship with God. So when you find out an answer from Scripture, you want this to be part of your relationship with our Lord and not just a magic or crypto magical use of getting Bible passages to figure out life or something. Uh, so, no, I don't recommend that. Um, and again, it doesn't help you to take the Bible out of context and then justify that. No, you should learn it in context. She'll learn to listen to the various movements of what's going on in your spirit and to see what is of the Lord, what is not. And usually that's best to do with someone who's either a spiritual director or a close friend who knows you and who can go back and forth with you and help you grow in that relationship with God and not just in pulling answers out of the thin air. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Uh, Lindaville, Vermont. Good to have you here. And what is your question? My question is about uh, mental illness and medicine. What about it? How does it either interact or uh, expand or even mm -hmm. is acceptable either with Catholic uh, practices or even sure. the Bible? Sure. You know, in terms of mental illness and medicine, um, you know, this is a, a very tricky interrelationship because some mental disorders have, you know, chemical imbalances at the cause. And in the case of chemical imbalances, it's, of course, very legitimate and one of the 
apparently one of the best ways to deal with through medicine. That's totally fine. But then there are some disorders that may not be based on chemical imbalances, but may be due to other traumas that can be dealt with in you know, a variety of other ways. For instance, I was just watching how a number of vets from Afghanistan and Iraq who are coming back with post-traumatic disorders, because you know, they, they've been through horrible traumas, sometimes physically themselves, sometimes being with people who were killed. And in the midst of that, they need a variety of other things. You know, again, I can't recommend or unrecommend medicine, but you know, for some of them, even having a dog that's trained to detect when they are depressed, when they're going into a downward uh, cycle, helps them tremendously and the dog they've just been training dogs to be able to help respond and it helps pull them out as the dog deals with them emotionally in physically nuzzing them and comforting them and then also it can help them learn to talk through what are very difficult things because with that kind of trauma you don't even know all that has happened, you don't know what's causing some of that trauma. You can say in general, but it's not so easy. And so there would be another kind of therapy that includes the comfort of uh, a, a well-trained dog, but also the uh, explanation and talking through and being able to weep and accept the other, pr other people around you. And Oftentimes, there are situations that are very much helped by, you know, uh, insights from a trained therapist. And at times, there are a combination of things. So, you know, this is where, you know, you look for the mental uh, uh, health experts, you know, to discuss some of these things with um, my own uh, preference is to work with um, the, uh, you know, the, the psychologist and dealing with other things rather than medicinal. It's a preference, but you know, I'm not an expert on, on that, and I'm not uh, able to decide which is better for individuals at all. People who are trained in that should be able to help you better. We have another uh, email. So, Dear Father Mitch, I'm a convert to Catholicism from Protestantism in 2010. I strongly believe in the beliefs of our Catholic faith, but I struggle with Mary's role. If I pray straight to Christ and not through Mary as co-mediatrix, am I going against the beliefs of the church? Is praying through Mary part what all Catholics must believe this is the only thing I struggle with. Now I agree uh, with our other beliefs about Mary, but I feel like more praise and worship is given to Mary than our Lord. The Rosary especially has more repetitive prayer and praise, it seems, to Mary than our Lord and the Lord's Prayer. Am I wrong to feel concerned? When did the teaching of Mary as Queen of Heaven and Mary as co-mediator come into the teachings of the church? And how did early Catholics in the days of the apostles view Mary? Does the Eastern Church, uh, Catholic Church, believe in Mary as mediator? Please correct me where I'm wrong. Ellie in Mobile, Alabama. Well, Ellie, you know, one, one of the things uh, in terms of understanding Our Lady's role as co-mediatrix, is uh, I recommend that you read Lumen Gentium in Vatican II, chapter eight. And that's a long section that goes through our theology of Mary's role. 
And in there, it brings up a number of things about her as co-mediatrix that, for instance, uh, that specifically refers to the promise in Genesis 3.15 where Eve is told, well, she, she's not even called Eve yet. She's just called the woman. She's told that your seed will fight against her seed. Okay? That is, the seed of the serpent will fight against the woman's seed. And what we see in the New Testament, besides Old Testament prophecies, we see in the New Testament that Mary is co-mediatrix because she agreed to be the mother of the Redeemer. She was freely given to her. She freely said, let it be. And so in that sense, she is with the co-mediatrix as cooperating. But in the Vatican document, as is true in earlier documents, it says very clearly that that title, co or anyone like it, co-mediatrix, co-redemptrix, so on, may not be understood as saying that she adds something that Jesus does not have nor does it take away anything from Jesus' unique role as Redeemer. It simply states the fact that she is there. And that as Simeon said to her, that a sword will pierce your heart, speaking to Our Lady, so that the inner thoughts of many might be revealed, so that she's given a role. And at the cross, where her heart is certainly pierced with sorrow, Christ entrusts her to us as mother and entrusts us to her as children. So this is where this, this and that's what the apostles thought because that's what they wrote down. So that's in terms of apostolic teaching. Now, the last thing I would say in terms of praying and asking her intercession, it's not that her or Jesus she is praying with you to help bring you to Jesus. And it's what all the saints do. And you see in the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 8, and in 8, verse 3, that our prayers are like nuggets of incense that the saints and angels take and they set on, the, on fire on the altar of God. Our prayers smell good, like incense, but they're released by the saints, they put them on fire, like a priest or altar boy puts the incense on a coal and releases the aroma more. Now, it's still God who answers. And I uh, urge you, Ellie, to take a look at the mass prayers on the feasts of Mary and all the other saints. We never make a prayer at mass in the name of Mary. We always pray in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, in union with the Holy Spirit. Our prayers are always directed on her feast days through Jesus to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is always the case. And that is the church teaching us how to get to intercession with Mary and the saints. We never pray, and, and I, I pray this through St. Ignatius of Antioch. No, that would be so foreign. We pray to, to God through Jesus, but we ask the saints to pray with us, just as I think about 32 times in the New Testament where Christians are asked to pray for one another. So one of the things have to deal with is that we've run out of time. So the Lord bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, I always like to remind you that this network is brought to you by you. So please remember us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we will be able to pay our bills too. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.